I'm so thrilled to be part of today's program today as representing Densho. My name is Naomi Ostwald Kamra, and I'm the new executive director of Densho. Um, some of you may be familiar with Densho, but Densho is a Seattle based public history nonprofit organization. Um, through our work, we document and share the stories of the Japanese American experience before, during, and after the World War II incarceration. We do this through our digital archives, our online encyclopedia, and educational resources that are freely accessible through our website, uh, densho.org, that's D-E-N-S-H-O.org. Uh, Densho is the Japanese word that means to pass on to the next generation. I'm so honored to be able to introduce Katie Yamasaki to all of you. Um, Katie is, through her father's side, a fourth generation Japanese American. Um, she's an incredibly talented person. She is an illustrator, she's a muralist, she's a dancer, she's a former classroom teacher, she's a community collaborator, she is a children's book author. She has authored eight children's books and she has over 80 murals around the world, including one of my personal favorites called the Moon Beholders, which you can find at the Japanese American National Museum in Little Tokyo, Los Angeles. Katie's recent book, Shapes, Lines, and Light, which is what she'll be kind of talking about today, um, is a beautiful tribute to her grandfather, Minoru Yamasaki. Um, Minoru was a world famous American architect, um, most famous for his design of the World Trade Center in New York City. Um, he's also from Seattle, and so he's designed a number of buildings here that you might all be familiar with, um, including the Pacific Science Center. Uh, Minoru faced a lot of um, challenging circumstances as a Japanese American architect against the backdrop of World War II America. He endured a lot of discrimination and anti-Asian racism. Uh, Katie, you shared with me that um, her grandfather passed away when she was 10 years old. And through this book project, um, it's one way for her to get to understand or know or learn more about her grandfather. What I find so touching is that I can see this as a way that a grandchild who is now an adult is seeking to connect with a grandparent who's no longer here. Um, I also think that it beautifully sort of illustrates how multidimensional her grandfather was and that he was someone that was more than the buildings that he is designed and was known for. Katie's book and also her own work and life contributions, I think, really align with what we do at Densho. It is our hope at Densho to share the stories of Japanese Americans so that others will recognize the rich diversity of the Japanese American community and recognize that our history is a uniquely American one. Katie's book also uh, really beautifully sort of shows us how important it is for us to share and listen to one another's stories. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Katie Yamasaki. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So nice to be here in Seattle. I have to say, um, I have been taking this book around since the fall. I'm so grateful to have been able to take it to the most kind of important cities in the United States for my grandfather and for the Japanese American community to Detroit, where uh, my family was and where he did a lot of his buildings and spent his most of his adult years to Los Angeles, which is um, a large part of the beating heart of the Japanese American community, um, to New York City, of course, where I live, where I've lived for the last 23 years. And um, here in Seattle, I have to say the welcome and reception for my grandfather and his work and this book as a result has been um, overwhelming. And I'm so grateful to you all for coming. I'm grateful to the Seattle Times for writing that wonderful article that I'm guessing brought maybe many of you here today and to Densho for um, not only just for their existence and what they do for our community, but also just specifically for the help they provided me with making this book. And it's an honor to be here at the Seattle Public Library, which is, I mean, what a building, what a gift. So um, today, you know, I've, I do children's books, so my um, presentations often range in age when I do these public programs from like three months to 85. So, um, and I like to have it be a bit of a conversation, so if at any time you have a question or a thought, or if I ask a question and you'd like to respond, I'd love to kind of have that 
uh, part of, be part of our program today in our conversation. So um, here's me, my grandfather, as um, Naomi mentioned, passed away when I was 10 years old and I grew up very curious about him. You know, he, where we grew up, um, where I grew up at least, was in a factory town north of Detroit and I grew up in the 80s. So for people who are familiar with Japanese American history, the 1980s were a tricky time in this country because of the recession, because of the automobile industry that my town was built around. We had a GM plant in the middle of our town and pretty much everybody outside of our family and a couple of other families worked at the GM plant. And so when the recession started to happen, the anti-Japanese hostilities in our town grew and in the entire kind of Detroit area grew. I was six when Vincent Chin was murdered and that was kind of the climate. There were a lot of um, kind of bumper stickers about you know Jap crap and stuff like that kind of around the automobile industry. But we also knew, you know, in the midst of all of this, that we had this grandfather who had done these amazing things. You know, what we mostly knew about, of course, were, was the World Trade Center, because that's what everybody mostly knew about. That was the, um, you know, they were at that time the tallest buildings in the world. But as I kind of grew, I, you know, I wondered about his childhood here in Seattle. You know, what it was to grow as a boy. He was born here in 1912, and that's his brother, Ken. Um, he's, he has a hat, my grandfather has a hat on. Um, but they were born at a time, you know, where if they wanted to go swimming in the public pools, that was not possible. They could swim at the YMCA. But if they wanted to go to a movie theater, they couldn't sit in the lower level, they would have to sit in the balcony. Um, but they also kind of grew at a t in this rich Japanese American community. And I kind of wondered what would make somebody grow in that way to want to, you know, build these beloved buildings. I just had the chance yesterday to go for the first time into the Seattle, um, to the Pacific Science Center. I've been there before, but it's always been closed, so I kind of look in through the, through the fence, and yesterday I was able to kind of go and walk around and explore his you know, principles of serenity, surprise, and delight, but really what I knew about as a kid were these buildings. It's what everybody in my town knew about, and so kids would be conflicted between saying things to me like, was your grandfather a kamikaze pilot? and other people saying things like, oh no, her grandpa designed the World Trade Center. You know, so the, um, what people were getting at home about what it was to be Japanese was really different than what I felt about being Japanese. I felt so proud. Um, but the school that I went to, the place that I lived, was a place where, for example, on um, December 7th, when I was in seventh grade, on the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, my seventh grade um, US history teacher said, Katie, you're Japanese, why don't you tell the class what happened today in history? So I went on to kind of explain what happened in my family, which was my great-grandfather was arrested that night because he was part owner of a produce market. Um, so they thought he must be a spy, um, which is as, just as insane as it sounds. Every time I say it, I think that just sounds so crazy. But so he went to a military prison and then my whole family on that side was sent to, um, they ended up at Amachi in Colorado in the, um, in the prison there. And when I finished telling my class that story, my teacher looked at me and he said, that never happened. And I said, yes it did. And he said, no it didn't. I said, yes it didn't. You know, we went back and forth, but I wasn't raised to really argue with my teacher, but it was kind of like this feeling of, well, that I know that happened, but there's also nothing here in my school that says that it happened. There's not a single book. You know, there's not a single, you know, I don't know about the other teachers. I, I didn't go around and ask the other teachers what they knew, but. Um, you know, it's been wonderful to kind of come to Seattle where his legacy has been so, so celebrated and to, so that I can kind of think about myself as this young reader who we got to choose, you know, how do you identify yourself? It was like sports or reading or whatever, and I chose Ravenous Reader. But it was the type of thing where I thought, I have this famous grandfather, but when I look in the library, there are no biographies of anybody that even looks like him. There are no biographies of anybody with brown skin. There are, there's a biography of um, Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. Otherwise, all of the biographies are of white people. And why is that? You know, it was baffling to me. And I think that that kind of planted a seed for me. And, um, you know, this book has come after many years and many rights and rewrites and revisions and revisions. But I'm really happy to share it with you today. And I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read it. And um, I may pause and ask some questions along the way. I uh, really like for this to be a conversation if possible. Shapes, lines, and light, my grandfather's American journey. And you may um, 
on a screen this size be able to see little places in the illustrations where certain elements, certain design elements from his buildings are woven into the illustrations. Old people, it turns out, were not always old, not even grandparents. Whenever I read this to kids, there's always at least one kid in the audience who says, what? <laughs> I learned that about my grandfather, Minoru. He was an architect and I called him grandpa. My grandma called him Tinky. Some people called him Min and the world called him Yama. Before he was my grandpa, he was a kid, a teenager even, a young man trying to find his way through the world. A lot of the world happened to him and he happened to a lot of the world. When Yama was young, he noticed a feeling in his chest that changed from space to space, in his rickety home, in his crowded neighborhood, and with his mother, father, and brother, he felt welcome. He felt curious and open. He felt seen. So he lived in the Yesler Hill section, which I guess now is called Yesler Terrace, and what he described was living in a tenement that at any time felt like it was apt to slide down the mountains right next to the logs that would be sliding down beside him. But there were other spaces, buildings that closed the open places in his heart, spaces that said, you are not welcome here, not your kind. Perhaps you will stock shoes for a store like your father. But there was a quiet voice inside Yama, my father is brilliant. Perhaps you will sweep factory floors on weekends like your father. The quiet voice spoke again. My father works hard. Perhaps architecture is too far a reach for someone like you. Yama listened to the quiet voice. You have no idea how far I can reach. Yama went instead to spaces where he felt welcome. Forests deep with evergreen, streams that sang him a calming song, sunlight glinting off rocks, spaces of light and freedom ignited his imagination. He worked harder than everyone else, swallowing the sharp ache that came from not being seen. Faces like his in places like this. He listened to that quiet voice inside, I will go to college and build my life but there was no money. He went to Garfield High School for anybody, for any locals here. Only freezing cold north, far away north, way north, Alaska, sweeping vistas, glittering waters, and dark canneries that reeked of rotten fish. No fresh air, no light, no rest working 18 hour days. So many Nisei like him, those born in America to parents who had come from Japan. Is this where they think we belong? I am building, I am saving. Every summer, Yama went to Alaska and paid his way through college. I'm just curious of everybody here, if anybody else had family or knew of people who went to work in the salmon canneries, if they weren't, yeah. You're, oh, maybe they work together. <laughs> I think it was a bonding experience for the people who were there at the same time. I, I thought, um, what's interesting when you read my grandfather's writing is he talks as much about the racism he experienced and the working conditions he experienced at those canneries as he talks about his buildings. It was such an important chapter. Yama studied for many years. He stayed at the top of his class Beautiful drawings, ideas like gardens growing in his mind. He was something special. So I would say um, when he was set to graduate college, he went to UW here and he had some wonderful professors um, that he really appreciated and respected. But the architecture school had a tradition up until the year he was graduating where every year they awarded the top graduating architecture students a scholarship to study at the Society of Beaux Arts in Paris. But the year he graduated, they canceled the whole scholarship so they wouldn't have to give it to him. And he was widely known to be like the best architecture graduate from the program. That always strikes me. It turned out 
um, okay, his father, in response, he was so angered by the whole thing, he took the whole family on a trip to Japan that they really couldn't afford, but that was where he was first introduced to Japanese architecture. And that was where he first kind of encountered the interplay between the outside and the inside. And um, so that was kind of from this era. I'll, I'll repeat the question. How did UW make amends for that? that who asked that question? I couldn't, okay, thank you. You know, I don't know, and I actually, um, I wasn't able to write about it quite as strongly as I wanted to in the author's note because of some uh, legal stuff. But I, um, <laughs> you know, I don't know that I don't know that they have. I don't have that information. I would like to think that they had. Um, they, I think that they justified it by saying it was the Great Depression or was the Depression, but it was something that was so abrupt. It was like one year they did it, the next year they didn't, the next year they did. It's a little hard to believe. But I would like to find that out. Thanks for asking that. But when it was time to get a job, America was in the middle of the Great Depression. Doors slammed, not hiring, especially eyes like yours, names like yours, faces like yours. And when he did get a job designing buildings, the world still told him, we do not trust your Japanese name, your Japanese face. Have you ever tasted something bitter in your mouth? That's how they said Japanese. This was when he moved out to New York City. He kept working harder than anyone else. He married a pianist named Teruko. The soulful sound of her music found its way into his work. Just after they wed, war began. Japanese families on the west coast of the United States lost everything. They were sent to desert prisons. Yama and Teruko's tiny New York City apartment overflowed with family escaping. So my grandmother was, um, her family was from Okinawa. She was born in Los Angeles and she had a full ride scholarship for her masters at Juilliard for, to become a concert pianist. Um, they were married on December 5th, 1941. And um, on December 7th, of course, was Pearl Harbor, which was when her father was incarcerated. And then they lost their business. The whole family went to Amachi and that was also the end of her education at Juilliard, sadly. So I think that one other piece of this puzzle that is always important that I always try to remind myself is the economic piece. When an, an entire community is economically devastated and I look at my grandfather who is working prolifically and what that meant for him in the bigger context of the family and the community. The FBI said, you are Japanese, suspicious. The police said, you are Japanese, show us your identification. The neighbors said, you are Japanese, you could be a spy. I was born in Seattle, I am building my life just like you. Every bitter sound made a brick, each brick built a stronger foundation. He added lines. He didn't want to feel the way they were trying to make him feel. He made shapes, he brought in light. So his first project as an architect was working on the Samson Naval Base, which was in upstate New York, and this was right at the beginning of the war. So he was designing this church and, um, and also other buildings on the base. And when he went to visit his own project, you know, that he was the head designer for, he was turned away at the gate by the military police who suspected him of being a spy. It was a bizarre time to even, you know, even in New York where he was um, regularly harassed and not trusted even with his own projects. He had a family, this resulted in them moving eventually to Detroit. He had a family, a Japanese American family that needed a place to live. First they were turned away again and again, but then they found a home, an old farmhouse in a town without red lines and cruel rules. They built and they grew. At his office, Yama worked and wondered, how can I make a space of light with a feeling of open doors and air that breathes, everyone is welcome here. Shapes combined with lines, combined with nature's light. Serenity, surprise, delight. Yama became his own boss, signed his own drawings, made buildings where people worked in harmony, where people worked in peace. For many years, he worked long, hard hours. Too long, too hard, he worked until his body said rest now. So he traveled and marveled. 
Soar, said the quiet voice inside as his spirit lifted into the arcs of the Alhambra. Peace like this, it said, as he beheld sun glinting on still water and paths of smooth round stones at the Katsura Palace. Inspired, Yama returned to fill his office with big thinkers from around the world, architects who worked side by side. People from many countries called Yama, asking him to design their buildings. The spaces he built connected to the humanity of everyday people. Workplaces, learning spaces, travel hubs, and sacred spots to gather were filled with serenity, surprise, and delight. He was very concerned with the workplace culture of his office, which was in Troy, Michigan, and it was directly as an impact of um, not only the work he did in the salmon canneries in Alaska, but by some of his bosses in New York City when he first started to practice as an architect, some of his bosses who really protected him and his family during the war and from some of the discrimination that they would have otherwise faced. So he saw both you know, the bad and the good side and wanted to, as a result, make his office be a, be a good place to work. His work grew, his name grew, the pressure upon him, that grew too. He made mistakes and had regrets that would take time to fully understand. People he worked with didn't always agree or share his vision. Things didn't always turn out the way he planned. Some of the reviews, I don't know if any of you have ever read them, but some of the reviews of his work um, would start out by talking about his body like his size, the size of his frame, and some, which was so absolutely unrelated to anything. Some would talk about, you know, the delicate, effem like kind of feminine forms that he was using, and it was kind of like this constant assault on, um, on his masculinity, I think, first, first off, but also just his general humanity, and that weighed really heavily. But so often, Yama found his way, bringing the outside world in, letting the sun shine through ceilings, illuminating shapes, the reflecting water of a still pool, quieting a busy mind so one might sit in peace. His shapes, lines, and light brought to so many serenity, surprise, and delight. Yesterday, somebody asked me about this spread, if this was, they had originally mistaken it for the, um, Pacific Science Center, but this is a building in Detroit, which I would put at the top of his work with the Pacific Science Center, um, which is McGregor Memorial. I don't know if anybody's been there in Detroit to see his work, but I highly recommend. And there was home, a home he made of shapes and lines and light, a home filled with Haruko's music, a home that was filled with children and then grandchildren. I was, that one's me right in the middle of the age range. Many years later, a terrible thing happened. But he had died years before. If he had been alive, his heart would have, been, would have broken into one million pieces, not for the buildings, but for all the people who went to work there in peace, for all their families, and for what happened afterward. I lived there then in New York City, and it made me wonder, what do buildings stand upon? There is the earth, the soil, the concrete, the steel beams. There are our stories. And the feeling we have in that space that is made from shapes and lines and light. Now, if you happen to see a copy at the library or pick up a copy today, you'll notice in the back of the book there are many pages of an author's note and uh, also many other buildings. Um, but I encourage you to kind of uh, read that. We'll discuss a lot of it today, but um, it's kind of the more in-depth in -depth read into his story. Um, this wasn't the first time that I wrote about my grandfather. My first book about him was as a third grader. And... <laughs> I, um, you know, at that time, what I knew, you know, I had this complex feeling of like, okay, well, people here seem to really hate Japanese people, but my grandpa was amazing, and so I made this book about him. My grandpa is an architect, you know, and, um, and I kind of just, you know, explored from a child's perspective what you might be curious about, the questions you ask, what's your favorite color, even if, even if it's not really a color. <laughs> um, and... 
you know, what I, what I got more interested in, you know, as I grew up and kind of grew into my own art, was why somebody who grew up in the world that he grew up in would want to create these spaces, right? Why somebody would want to kind of like form their life around these principles of serenity, surprise, and delight, and bring that to people when it was something, when it was perhaps one of the paths of most resistance. You know, when, when you look at who he was, you know, a Japanese American man coming from a public institution into the elite world of architecture, which was entirely white at that time, mostly Ivy League, except for Ayan Pei, who was also from the Ivy League, um, he did not fit in. You know, he did not fit in, but he had these things to say. And not only did he not fit in in terms of who he was and what his background was, but the type of work he wanted to make was very much not in style. What people were making at that time were things to kind of intimidate or overwhelm, and he wanted to make things that were meant to uplift and to delight. So I thought, you know, how does somebody go from this? You know, this was from their childhood home, no running water, you know, with very stylish parents um, who somehow, you know, made it work. My great grandfather had so many jobs, and they kind of made it work, but the world was not so accommodating. And I thought about, you know, what I grew up with was no Japanese community. But when I went through Densho and when I, you know, heard family stories and went through all of our extensive family albums, what I saw was this really rich Japanese American community out here. And I started to think about like, how would it feel if the people who lived in your community looked like your parents and spoke the same language as your parents and your, your face was reflected in a loving way all around you? And I think in many ways that kind of counter, counterbalanced a lot of the other things that he was experiencing. Um, so I, I thought a lot about when he was graduating, you know, and when he was, when he was working and the environment that he was kind of working in. Because when he started to kind of go into architecture and to think about making buildings, these were the buildings that were being made for his community, for our community. You know, and you think about what, um, what did his work set, set out to do, you know, to uplift. And then you think about what did, what did the world kind of see as fitting for the Japanese American community. The, um, the pictures that I find from this era uh, really resonate in a lot of the time when I do author visits in schools with a lot of kids who kind of see this stuff in the context of um, other communities today, particularly black and brown communities, but thinking about how the world was set to consider Japanese people, right? When I look at this picture on the right, you know, that's not even a human skin tone, right? I think about like how um, people were encouraged to think about the Japanese as kind of animal-like or as scary or as dangerous and how, um, how so much of kind of what we're living with today as well is um, it kind of reflects that still. When I was working on this book, I think one of the hard things was to think about his journey as a young man. I was working on this book in 2020 and 2021, and it was very much the time of a lot of the anti-Asian sentiment kind of going, coursing through the country again with COVID, and it was pretty crushing. And um, I thought a lot about what he wanted to instill, and I think that, you know, in large part, the experiences of his childhood maybe made him want to um, create spaces that would, would have made him feel other, you know? I think that he grew up in a world that maybe said that your life doesn't have inherent value. You know, you're not, you don't really deserve to go to college, you don't deserve to work in a safe place. Um, but he wanted to kind of create these places where actually people can feel their most human. He was often inspired by forms in nature, you know, and kids often recognize this as like, um, butterfly wings, or somebody said this reminded them of like an elephant's trunk. Um, but I think a lot about how when um, asked about his work, people always think about the World Trade Center. So people always would kind of center the World Trade Center. I think the main reason that I wanted to do this book in the first place was to kind of move away from the World Trade Center because that was what people knew. I had somebody come up to me once, an architect, and say, oh, Yamasaki. World Trade Center and Pruitt Igo, which was the picture in the building with like the big thunder clouds over. Um, what a tough legacy. And I thought, wow, that is a problem because he designed like 200 buildings and you know two. 
You know, and what I, what I found out was at a certain point, he wasn't being taught at many architecture schools. His work wasn't taught because all people knew him for were two buildings that were badly exploded on national television, you know? And so um, I, my first, I don't know if it was my first, but one draft that I did of the book that was years and years ago, maybe 2006, did center the World Trade Center. Because for me as a kid, that was kind of at the middle, you know, because you think the tallest. But then I started to think about like, well, actually, what's most interesting about his work is the human side of it and how what he really wanted was for people to come into these spaces and feel fully human, right? And have these arcs and these spaces and this light kind of coming in as a way to enhance your human experience. So I started kind of playing around with a different way to approach the book. This was much later. You know, I brought in my friend to kind of model. He was much more muscular than my grandfather was, but um, <laughs> uh, brought him in to, to model for the book. And I was thinking, you know, if you've seen any of my other work, I'm much more of a painter and not such a technician in the way that my grandfather was. Um, so I decided I would approach it by doing collage and kind of um, be able to put all these pieces together in a little bit more of a graphic way. That was kind of the only way I could imagine doing it and everything kind of comes together at my studio. And um, luckily, because of the publisher I work with, my editor Simon is here right now, um, I was able to give this book a lot of space. You know, it's a much longer picture book than most books, but the space that I wanted to kind of um, feel, or that I wanted to evoke, which is the space that he has in his own in his own work. And a lot of people have been kind of wondering, or kids, you know, not a lot of people, but a lot of like the little people who I talk to all the time, they think like, oh, is your work, how is your work and your grandpa's work um, the same? And this is the mural that Naomi referenced in, um, in her introduction. And I think that one thing we have in common, you know, I originally did not want to be an artist, and it was largely because I looked at my grandfather's work and I was like, that is too much to live up to. And I looked at my, my grandma's work and she was a concert pianist, you know, so much incredible technique, and I listened to her music and that's too much to live up to. And then I look at my Uncle Taro's work, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, and I thought, this is too much pressure. <laughs> I'm going to be a social worker. And, um, <laughs> um, but I kind of found my way to storytelling, and um, that kind of took the pressure off because it kind of felt like, well, what I really want to do is find stories that don't get told enough. I'll start with the stories of my family, which my teachers have actually told me didn't happen. You know, so stories that are untold and um, undertold. So um, this is... This was a project that kind of made me think of my grandfather, not just because it's at a Japanese American museum, but also because, you know, because our work looks nothing alike. I mean, he mostly used white with white with white, and there's 50 different shades of white, but, um, and I use as many colors as I can find, but um, these are spaces, what I hope is that these are spaces that, as his work did, make people feel fully human and fully seen. I have a really good friend in Brooklyn who's African-American who grew up in the neighborhood that we live in now. And we were talking about going out to eat one time. He said, oh, I don't go into a lot of those restaurants because I don't feel like it's a place that was made for me. I don't really feel comfortable there. And I think, what is this world? You know, and I think that that was a lot of what my grandfather experienced. And um, you know, I think that when it comes to doing the stories, finding the stories of the people who get left to the side are the ones that I most want to tell. So I work a lot in... Um, with communities who are impacted by incarceration. Some, and this is kind of a direct result of you know, the experience of my own family, but also just looking at the world today and thinking, well, this is a lot of people who are kind of forgotten about and pushed to the side. So for example, you know, this is a group of young men outside of Philadelphia who had been incarcerated for one reason or another. Um, and we were doing a project, this was shortly after Trayvon Martin's murder. And we asked them, we said, how do you see yourself um, and how do you see, how do you think other people see you? So the, this is a 16 year old boy. So he wrote, good at all sports, peaceful, kind hearted, compassionate, humble, responsible, ladies man, great kisser, you know, all, all of these wonderful things for a 16 year old to be, right? Um, knows how to dance. You know, and then he said, well, if you're walking down the street, how do you think people see you? And he said, dumb, ugly, not going to be anything, crazy, scary, mean not fun to be around, and worse, you know? And those, what we know, 
is that though that difference is actually violent and dangerous you know and so what i think about we did this project where you know they painted on cloth and we took those cloths around a different community in their community so that um, the, you can see like this is the cloth and then it gets adhered to the wall as if it was um, painted on the wall. But it was a way for them to have a voice in their community. But I am smart, responsible, caring, loving, kind-hearted, loyal. But then there's also a part in blue, is he? Is he kind-hearted? Is he hardworking? Is he peaceful? And kind of challenging the viewer, if you're wondering, is he? Why is that? Why are you wondering that? What are those assumptions? And you know, these projects and these themes come up because I think about my own family. And on the left is, um, is my grandmother's family that immigrated from Okinawa. My grandmother is on the right-hand side, the taller of the two girls. You know, and I think about my grandfather's family in Seattle. And I think about how I describe my own family, and I would be curious, I'm sure a lot of people here also have immigrant stories in their family or different parts of their family story that felt very misunderstood. And I think about words that I might use to describe my family, hardworking, creative, loving, you know, adventurous, curious. And then I think about how they were considered at that time. The fact that my great grandfather, who was a produce salesman, was considered a spy, still to, you know, it doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense in my mind. I can't make that leap, but spy, traitor, enemy, animal-like, and I, um, you know, there are reasons that these things exist, right? And there are reasons that these boys who are in this detention center have this experience of people thinking these ways about them. And I look at what there used to be, you know, how to tell the Japs from the Chinese, you know, really specific, step by step, you know, and how can we kind of challenge ourselves to be really critical consumers of this, um, of the things that are said about us. Because when I see my family, that's not what I see. You know, and when I see people um, judging these teenage boys and these terrible things happening to these teenage boys today, you know, that's not what I see. Um, but that was, there was a lot of motivation for me with this book at the time that I ended up making it. I mean, because I literally have probably been working on it for 15 years before it was published. But um, I think the heartbreaking part about the process of making the book was how relevant so much of the hardship still felt. You know, it kind of, there would be days when I'd be working on the project, I'd be working on, you know, maybe a part where like he was being profiled by the FBI or harassed by his neighbors. And then there would be these incidences, you know, that would be going viral on online about what was happening in the Asian community. And it's pretty crushing, you know. So I, I kind of just continue to devote myself to trying to create spaces where we can see each other and see ourselves more clearly. Um, this is a women's prison. This is the first prison that I ever worked in, and it's in Mexico, and um, in southern Mexico, in Chiapas. And so if you are a woman who gets incarcerated in Mexico, and 75% of the women in my group were there because of a domestic violence-related incident, most of them um, spoke in indigenous language, not Spanish, and there was no legal support available for anybody outside of Spanish. So those were the circumstances. If you had a child under four years old, that child would go with you into the prison if you didn't have another place to put them. So when I got there, they wanted kind of, the people who are in charge of the prison said, we want you to just decorate the wall because the kids are here and they're playing maybe like Disney characters or something. But then the moms came out and they said, no, 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 we want to tell our stories. We want to have a space where we can tell our stories. And um, you know, it doesn't show it so well in this picture, but from left to right, it kind of, we only had six days for this project, but it was like a, just kind of like a sequential story of trauma and then this attempt at recovery so that eventually they could, there could be some amount of freedom. You know, and on the one hand, connecting this to my grandfather's work feels a little bit of a stretch, but on the other hand, I think it's like the quest for humanity and to kind of recognize everybody's humanity in every space that you occupy. You know, it could be a prison, it could be a high school where kids want to see the world that they live in and see their own history represented on the walls all around them rather than reading old-fashioned textbooks that leaves out giant swaths of their own history. Um, it could be at a school for kids with special needs. This is my most recent mural, and it is a school where 100% of the kids 
live at or below the poverty line and 100% of the kids have um, significant special needs. So they wanted to do a mural that showed their bravery. This was painted, this was just after COVID. They wanted to do a mural that showed um, their bravery, their creativity, and the diversity of things that they like to do, the diversity of ways that they existed in the world. And then the teachers wanted a mural that showed their loyalty and showed their support and showed their protective nature. So the lion kind of worked as this giant symbol. I mean, how much the kids love this lion made me think I should only be painting lion murals ever for the rest of my whole career. <laughs> but, um, you know, and then the, the moving circles underneath are kind of, it's kind of like if you've ever tried to be in a ball pit and it's so hard to stand and it's so hard to find stability, but the, the teachers and the staff of that amazing school are constantly um, in the quest to provide stability in a world that is changing underfoot at all times. And this was, you know, the experience of being a teacher during COVID in the New York City public schools. Um, you know, and I think at the end of the day, this is just all an effort to create a world. This is my daughter a couple years ago, but to kind of create a world where people see themselves and kind of acknowledge their own, they see their own humanity reflected back. And when it comes to my grandfather, I always wonder, you know, what would, um, what would he say to the young people that I'm talking to right now about this book? Um, and if, and how would his life have been different if when he was a child, the outside world had told him that his life had inherent value for the simple fact of his existence? Because he spent an immense amount of his life proving his worth and deciding that he was going to be seen. And I know that there are a lot of people in this room who have family members whose parents and grandparents did the exact same thing, that they would be seen, that they would work two or three or four times as hard to just be seen and just get at least the smallest amount of professional or personal um, appreciation for the work they did. But that came at the expense of a lot of other things. You know, that kind of doggedness to be seen and to prove one's humanity definitely came at the expense of his health, among other things, and I wish he didn't have to prove that. You know, I might not be here right now and speaking to you about his amazing buildings, you know, if he didn't feel that he needed to prove himself, but that would, I would be totally fine with that. <laughs> um, and I think that he would want to start out by looking at all the kids, you know, at any given auditorium, any given school presentation, and kind of remind them that no matter what they want to be, if they want to be an artist, if they want to be a doctor, if they want to be a, you know, if a teacher, that you don't have to be. I'm totally projecting here because actually, <laughs> I'm totally projecting because he felt inclined to be the best in the world. But that was because he was uh, told that his life didn't matter in many, many different ways. Um, what I wish for him was that somebody would have told him that you can just be who you are, figure out who that is, and have a meaning, have a life of meaning and a life of relationship. Um, because he would say things like, why be the best in the world when you can be the best in the history of the world? And that's quite a burden. You know, I always laugh when I say it, but I, I would not want to have to be a child growing up in that household where the ex expectation was, why be the best in the world when you can be the best ever? Why be, one quote, why be Yo-Yo Ma when you could be Bach? What? <laughs> so I think that, um, you know, I think that at this point, you know, and by the time, you know, he reached the end of his life, I think he had seen things quite a bit differently and that he would encourage kids to find something that gave them happiness and meaning and allowed them to be like contributing members of their family and of their society and go with that path. Um, but this whole endeavor is my attempt to get to know him, you know, from the adult perspective. I grew up hearing stories about him, and I grew up, you know, with my cousins all trying to figure this out, and I'm just one person in a pretty large family of, I'm, I know I'm related to a couple people here who I'm just now meeting for the first time <laughs> even, but, um, but I have my version and kind of my hypothesis that he did all of this work in response to the world that he lived in, um, it for better or for worse, you know, on both sides of that. But, you know, I would love for him to tell his own story as well. But this is my best go at it. So thank you so much for listening. And I would love to take your questions or, or your thoughts or anything. Yeah, thanks.
Yeah, you know, um, thanks for bringing that up. He said he was kind of a folk hero when you were growing up. Yeah, he, I think that um, there was a, you know, when the war happened and everybody was incarcerated and everybody lost everything, and my grandfather was on the East Coast starting his career and then kind of rising to a certain amount of prominence, he became kind of a folk hero, you know, as you said, like to a lot of people in Japanese American community, and that meant a lot to him, I think. It meant a lot to him that people um, in the community appreciated him, and, um, and it also was pressure, you know, it also was pressure that he wanted to really live up to. And I think that, you know, I, for people, if they were incarcerated or not, there were different pressures. He definitely needed to kind of carry the weight of a lot of people in our family as a result of being the person who may, remained employed. So we have a couple questions okay. here. One is, what is the curved building at the bottom of the garden collage? So I don't know if you are oh, able to- the curved building at the bottom of navigate the- Navigate oh, back. Let's see, I can go back. I know, the art is just so amazing. I forgot. This one? Is, is that the right one? Um, yes, this we're building on. at the bottom is the St. Louis Airport, which I haven't been to. Lambert, the Lambert Terminal. And of course, these are, you know, my interpretation of them. There are other things that are missing from it, but those are kind of the basic shapes. This, um, the amount of windows and things that he put into his buildings in terms of collage was murderous for me to, <laughs> to do and to cut out. Um, it wasn't like a cut and paste digitally, it was like cut out with an X-Acto knife. So some of these, if you see them in real life, you might think that was way more complex than what she showed in the book. That's okay. So this may be a little personal, but the slide that uh, referred to the mistakes and failures yeah. that he made, yeah. um, somebody is wondering sure. what that might refer to since the lawyers aren't here. Yeah. <laughs> so let me show you this um, specific spread. Sorry, if this is dizzying. Um, Pruitt-Igo was a building that um, was in St. Louis, here we go, it was a public housing experiment and um, you know when you're the architect you're working with the developer and you're often working with like the local legalities and the rules and the codes of the time. He had um, certain ideas for Pruitt-Igo which was supposed to be um, public housing um, I think segregated public housing for black families and white families. It ended up being a total disaster. He wanted it to be lower scale, smaller scale, um, not so many stories, not so dense. Um, but because of money and the time that it was built, it ended up being much more packed, um, abandoned by the white families. So it was um, kind of very densely populated um, in a way with urban African American families. And it, did not work at all. And I, you know, I think he was, it was a failure of a project. He was scapegoated for a lot of it. He didn't want it to go the way that it was, but uh, was kind of pushed into making certain decisions. Um, and it was a disaster and it weighed really heavily on him. And I think that he wished he had never done that project. Um, it was a circumstance for him, I think, you know, he's never told me this because I was 10 when he died, but I think that for him, for a lot of the bigger projects, it was hard for him to turn them down or walk away from them financially because in the 1950s, it was post-war. It was post-war for the Japanese American family. And he was supporting a lot of people and he also was supporting an office. So he didn't come from a big net of wealth of, um, you know, pass on these and take the one, only ones that you love. But it was a, a pretty big disaster and he was largely the scapegoat for it, but the conditions around it were really um, complex. I would encourage you to read the book called Nobody by Mark Lamont Hill, um, which has a really good kind of description of what happened in Pruitt-Igo because a lot of the residents from Pruitt-Igo ended up migrating to Ferguson, um, which is where the um, uprising was in Ferguson. So um, it recently Pruitt-Igo came back into public consciousness, but this building and the World Trade Center were part of the reason why I wanted to do this book because this was his legacy for a lot of people, these two disasters. Yes, they were both much smaller. They were not so, so big and so tall, but I think that in terms of density, in terms of money and like efficiency, the developers wanted him to be taller. Yeah. For, 
for, for Pruitt, I go, yeah, for both the serenity, the experience. Well, I know, so for the World Trade Center, they cleared out so much of lower Manhattan so that there could be that plaza, if you ever experienced being in that plaza, which was this kind of uplifting space with a beautiful fountain and kind of a break from the rest of the kind of um, bustling, dense lower Manhattan. Uh, for Pruitt Igo, there were these spaces that were designed, these outdoor patios and lots of green space for the families, but a lot of that also got kind of lost in the, design, in the construction and in the development. But that was something that he was really trying to, um, to work at, but it just didn't work. There's actually documentaries about this, this project as well. But, um, you know, I think that what I really wanted to show with this spread was that for kids especially that no career, no matter what you have, just has this rise to the top trajectory without any falls and bumps along the way. And this was a big one for him. But it also wasn't the end of things. It was kind of the beginning of things. So I think in all of it, you know, you learn, he learned to um, speak up with the developers to kind of have his voice heard a little bit more because it is, you know, a lot of these buildings are really by committee. Thanks for that. We have several okay. more questions, but I also want to be respectful of everybody's time and um, wiggles. Um, but we've got a nice question about Pacific Science Center. Um, somebody says, I visited there recently, and it reminded me of Gothic architecture. Can you talk about your grandfather's design statement, influences, and objectives on that building? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think that he definitely was inspired by Garth Gothic architecture, by Islamic architecture, by walking through like the cathedrals of Europe where you kind of are, go through a narrow passageway and then you enter into this big cathedral and you have this, he used to say to my dad, he said, it makes you feel like this. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that the arches of the Pacific Science Center uh, reflect that feeling. And I, I love those because it kind of, they really valued the kind of emotional experience of the buildings because those arches don't, you know, they're not a roof and they're not four walls, they're not a functional thing, but they're investing in and prioritizing the emotional experience of being in a space and I appreciate those buildings so much more after being there yesterday, yeah. Oh, that's great. And another person is wondering, and you kind of touched on it here and there, but was his personality uh, at work the same as it was at home? Were they different? You know, I did, since I was 10 when he died, I'm not exactly sure, but I, I think people loved working with him. That's, he had a reputation for um, being nice to work with, but he definitely wasn't a pushover. Um, he, and he kind of spoke up and spoke his mind, but he was, you know, in the way that not a lot of architects made it onto the cover of Time Magazine, he was beloved by the public. And, you know, I think his home personality was often a reflection of what what else was consuming him in his life. You know, there's a really nice picture of them having dinner together, but he often wasn't able to make it home for dinner. You know, he he worked so much and he traveled so much. So, um, and he was of a generation where gender, you know, played into the role in the family and um, it wasn't like 2022 or 2023, sorry. Um, but uh, in terms of my experience with him in the home and my cousin's experience, he was very kind and gracious and loved having us around. It was kind of like, he wouldn't get on the floor and build blocks with us, but he would sit happily in his chair and watch us. <laughs> That's great. Give you critiques. <laughs> What's that? Give you critiques on right. the block buildings. Right. Exactly. Or, uh, well, this is not a question, uh, but a plea. Your grandmother sounds like an amazing lady. Please write a book about her. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, every time I talk about this book, thank you, and people, especially kids, will start to talk about their grandpas. And then I'm like, what about the grandmas? And what about the great aunts? And what about the moms? You know, because every single thing that I researched for this book, all this travel and all of this stuff, I think, what was happening at home? Like, what was my grandma up to? And I think part of what kind of is hard for me is I think about my grandma's career as a concert pianist and how that was cut short by the war, but also how those two careers to coexist in a household with children was a little much. I think it was a little more... And because she was the mom, my impression is that that might be why her career went by the wayside. And she was a spectacular piano teacher, but she was actually a spectacular pianist. You know, so I, I, I do have a kind of ache for her that I wish she had been able to pursue that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we have uh, one final question here. Um, I think time for just one more. I will take this moment to let folks know that Katie is gonna be signing books at this table right over here after the event. So if you did get a book, you can get that signed by Katie. And I also wanted to take a minute to thank Densho and Elliott Bay Book Company, our partners on this event, and of course the Seattle Public Library Foundation and the Gary and Connie Kunis Foundation and the Seattle Times. Because, you know, let's give them a round of applause. We're grateful. So to, to end out today, if you could ask your grandfather one question, any question today, what would you like to know? I think I would probably ask him a question to talk about why he cared so much about the human experience and what was it that made him want to create spaces where people felt so fully human. Because he was designing with the idea that the human experience matters so much. I'm not trying to impress upon you my architectural power. I want to create some space for you to feel most like yourself. You know, and like, I would want him to read my book and tell me if I was right or wrong, if, <laughs> if I got it right. But I would uh, really love for him to, um, to talk about that, you know, and I mean, there would be, I don't know if, I don't know who asked that question, but it would have to be a longer conversation. <laughs> It could be over dinner. Yeah. yeah, right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Thank for you being all so here. much. Thank I you all for coming. Thank you.